It is therefore time for question period. The member from Sault Ste. Marie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Recently, I travelled to the Matawa First Nations of Nibinibik, Webekwe, Nishkantiga, and Yabamatong to see the living conditions there. Nibinibik fears a community evacuation because their power system may not survive the winter. They, along with Nishkantiga, have been on a boil water advisory for decades. Imagine an entire generation of youth not knowing something as simple as turning on the tap for a glass of water. These and many other poor conditions are causing an even greater tra tragedy. There is a suicide epidemic that is claiming the lives of too many young children. Can you even fathom the state of hopelessness when kids as young as 12 are taking their own lives? These conditions exist in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, and they are unacceptable. So to the minister, what will you do to bring immediate relief to these First Nations? Will you end the power and the water crisis now? Will you take action to end the tragic suicide epidemic that is killing you. Ontario's youth? Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Thank you for that uh, important question. Uh, the water issue, cleaning water issue, is of utmost, utmost paramountcy to this government, indeed to First Nations, and I should add to the federal government. And that's why this government is working uh, closely with the federal government to resolve this uh, cleaning water issue. The federal government has responsibility for on-reserve uh, matters, clean drinking water, but the provincial government plays an important role in working with the federal government, in working with First Nations, in providing provincial expertise in water treatment. Speaker, I have been to uh, uh, 119 or 100, 120 First Nations. Especially in the remote northern communities, a part of my visit always includes a treatment to the water treatment facility, if there is one. Answer. And in some First Nations, there is not a water treatment facility. And I can tell you, when you see the difficulties with the water treatment facilities, and then you go to other First Nations, you. and you see that they don't even have a water treatment facility. This Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again to the minister. The socio-economic and infrastructure challenges within these communities are similar to those we would see in third world countries. Following the discovery of the Ring of Fire, the Liberal government signed a regional framework agreement, the RFA, with all the Matawa First Nation communities so that these living conditions could be addressed in the consultation process. The Liberals then hired high-priced consultants to negotiate the Ring of Fire road development. It's been 11 years now and there has been no progress on the road beyond Liberal announcements filled with empty election promises. Shame. To date, these, fa these failed negotiations have wasted taxpayers in excess of $30 million. Wow. Mr. Speaker, after all this wasted money, these communities continue to live in third world con conditions Apollo. and are in desperate need of help. Right so to the minister. Wouldn't you think all this money would have been better spent on solutions to the living conditions in these communities, as opposed to padding the pockets of high-priced Liberal consultants? Thank you. Minister. Speaker, thank you for that, uh, that question. Look, a, a necessary component to relieving the conditions, the difficult conditions we find in the far north is economic development, resource development, and finding a way for First Nations to share responsibly and fairly in the benefits of resource development. I know the member opposite was on a tour of the Ring of Fire recently. I too, uh, about two weeks ago, was at the Ring of Fire with Minister Morrow, with Minister Gravel and myself, executives from Noron, and chiefs from the Matawa Tribal Council. We had an on-site meeting. We sat in a, in a uh, ring in the outdoors, at the Ring of Fire, we received a thorough briefing Order. from the chiefs, from Noron, and from the uh, political uh, people that attended uh, that meeting. I can tell you that there is a willingness from the First Nations, Answer. from Noron, and from government to develop the Ring of Fire so that we can provide the economic opportunity, which will go a long, long way to improving conditions. Thank you. I remind the minister and all members, when I stand, you sit. Final supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again to the minister. The road that was initially proposed to unlock the economic opportunity in the Ring of Fire 
runs through Matawa First Nation lands and as such requires their consent. To obtain that consent, the Liberal government signed an RFA with these communities, promising to negotiate in good faith. Yabamatong and Nishkantiga have not agreed to this development, fearing the road alone will not address or improve their community living conditions. The Premier's answer to this roadblock was to change the rules of the RFA. Now she plans to reroute the road to avoid their lands so that they won't have a say. However, Yabamatong and Nishkantiga hold historical land claims in the Ring of Fire. This is a slap in the face to those negotiations. To the Minister, is this your government's idea of good faith negotiations? Thank you. Minister? You've got to pick a lane. You can't drive in both lanes at the same time. Minister of Municipal Affairs has, will come to order. So, the reason that Minister Gravel and I and Minister Morrow, Noron executives, and the Ring of Fire chiefs went to the Ring of Fire about two weeks ago. We spent the day there in extensive briefings, extensive consultations to find out how best to deal with the transportation corridor issue. Obviously, if we're going to extract minerals with the involvement and the participation of First Nations, there has to be a transportation corridor to remove those uh, minerals, those assets to smelters and other places. That was the purpose of the meeting. That's why this government has invested a bill set aside a billion dollars for a transportation corridor. And we are presently in negotiations with our federal counterparts. We are in negotiations with the private sector to execute a, a plan that is satisfactory, that is satisfactory to the nine Matawa Thank chiefs. You. The meeting so New question, the member from Nipissing. Thank you and good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Acting Premier. Under the Fiscal Transparency and Accountability Act, the Finance Minister is required to provide a fall economic statement. Over the last 30 days, we've all heard the warnings made about this government's documents. The Legislature's Financial Accountability Office says the budget will not balance because the numbers are based on, quote, unlikely assumptions. Last month, the Auditor General said this government has, quote, significantly misstated the numbers for two years running. Last week, the AG said, quote, the government is making up its own accounting rules. Speaker, to the Acting Premier, is there even a remote chance we're going to see any numbers we can believe? Thank you. Acting Premier, Minister Finance. Finance. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I, I reject the premise of this question and, and, the, indi and the notion in which the individual is trying to uh, also reflect the, the fact that Ontario, by all accounts, is leading Canada. We have the lowest unemployment uh, in 17 years, over 800,000, almost 800,000 net new jobs in the depth of the recession. And Mr. Speaker, we've been very open and transparent, and we've beaten our targets consistently year over year, as attested by public accounts, which the Auditor General does confirm. So, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite may they talk about uh, expectations and exaggerations. We deal with the facts here, Mr. Speaker, and we are exceeding and delivering for the people of Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you. Back to the Acting Premier. Well, that's certainly not what the Auditor General told us last week. Exactly. The Transparency uh, Act also requires the Finance Minister to release August and February reports every year, but sadly, this minister has missed issuing almost all of them since his appointment. Considering the lack of trust in this government's numbers, we can see why they choose to snub their nose at our laws. Okay. The minister is also required to publish a pre-election finance report to, re to be reviewed by the Auditor General. The government must provide detailed accounts, the very numbers that the Financial Accountability Officer says would be, quote, not be achieved. The very numbers the Auditor General says, quote, we cannot rely on. Speaker, will the government produce a pre-election report, and will there be any numbers in it we can actually believe? Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this is a good question, and I'll tell you why. That party, when they were in power, they gave us a bogus budget that would contain a five and a half billion. Come to order.
because of their this in the past, Mr. Speaker, we passed the law requiring that all governments going forward must be open and transparent and deliver those very opportunities for the entire province to see before the next election. We are doing that, Mr. Speaker. The fall economic statement is going to be delivered very shortly, as will the future reports that is being questioned here, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Before I turn to the member, I would ask him to listen. Final supplementary. Again to the Acting Premier, the two reports aren't the only documents the members of the House are waiting for, Speaker. The government has withheld thousands of emails from the Auditor General and spent $500,000 on hired lawyers wow. to stall their release. Wow. The Auditor General and this legislature are entitled to those documents, not some of them, Speaker, all of them, oh. and we want them now. Not only that, but the media were told in a response to Freedom we're of Information Barry. request that no documents on consultants exist when clearly they do. Speaker, to the acting premier, the last Liberals that said there were no documents are now in a courtroom down the street. Is that where this one is heading to? Thank you. Minister. Minister of Energy, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, our government remains committed to being open and transparent and continues to cooperate. The member from Leeds Grenville will draw. What did you say? Carry on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And we continue to cooperate with the Office of uh, the Auditor General. Um, for example, the independent electricity system operator has so far provided 1,200 records to the Auditor General. OPG has provided hundreds of records. The Ontario Financing Authority has provided 3,242. Treasury Board has provided thousands um, of records. We've provided 13,212. And in this process, Mr. Speaker, and throughout everyday operations, we're adhering to all document retention standards. Additionally, Mr. Speaker, the ministry has informed me that we're continuing to release additional information to the Auditor General, and we're doing this because we understand the importance of providing the Auditor Answer. with everything that she's asked for, Mr. Speaker. The ministry has been uh, regularly providing the Auditor General uh, with um, additional responsive documents each week, and we'll continue to adhere to this process. Thank you. New question, the Leader of the Third Party. Speaker, my question is for the Acting Premier. Thanks to the Auditor General, we now know that the Premier and her Liberal government are forcing Ontario families to pay $4 billion just to hide the damage that her hydro borrowing scheme will do in the long run. We know that she was warned about the cost, we know she was given other options, and we know she went ahead anyways. Can the Acting Premier tell us who made the decision to ignore staff warnings and push ahead with a $4 billion scheme? Mr. Speaker, again, the premise of the question is, is erroneous. The estimation by the Financial Accountability Officer made reference to what he felt were estimated numbers based on estimated borrowings, which were re reminding everyone that that is not actually what has taken place. And so, Mr. Speaker, the premise of the question is erroneous. There is a, 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 a plan before us which reduces um, hydro rates, electricity rates for Ontarians across the province by 25 percent, enabling us to do so in a responsible manner, which the opposition have now declined. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Trust the estimations of the FAO and the Auditor General much more than I would expect to trust the estimations of the government. If you recall, this government estimated a $40 million cost of the gas plant scandal, and that was $1.1 billion, Speaker. So I'm not going to take their estimations, definitely not. In addition to the $4 billion, Speaker, that this Premier spent to hide the real cost of her $40 billion borrowing scheme, they also forked over another $2 million to consultants to help design said scheme. Since they won't tell us about the $4 billion, will the Liberal government at least make these consultants' contracts? public so Ontarians know who exactly it is that's advising the Premier and what direction she was given. President of the Treasury Board. Yes, thank you very much, Speaker. And uh, first of all, I think it's important to understand that the numbers that the uh, 
leader of the third party is throwing around were estimates of something or other projections that came from the FAO. They were not documents that were ever presented to Cabinet on which to base a decision. They were projections that came after the fact. They were not Cabinet decision-making documents. The decision that Cabinet did make was an important policy decision to say that things that actually have to do with electricity production belong on the rate base from an accounting and from a real uh, perspective, financial fiscal plan perspective. Things which have social policy impacts Answer. belong on the tax base, and that's exactly what the accounting is based on is that policy decision Thank to you. put electricity on the rate base. Supplementary. I, you know, I have not been gobsmacked in this pace place for a long time, but for a minister to get up and talk about estimations of something or others is pretty worrisome. For a governing party to do that is pretty worrisome. We know that the Liberal government knew how much it was going to cost to hide the disastrous effect of their borrowing scheme from the public. We know that they knew it was going to cost Ontario families $4 billion to do, and clearly they just didn't care that they were going to spend $4 billion to cook up this scheme. We also know that the people of this province paid an additional $2 million for consultants to tell them how to pull it off. Why is the Liberal government putting themselves and their party ahead of families once again? They're looking after their political interests, the interests of the Liberals and this Premier, instead of putting the interests of, in, with, of the families of this province who are struggling just to make ends meet and pay their skyrocketing hydro bills. Thank you. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to our policy decision, we actually made a decision that helps every single family in this province, Mr. Speaker, by reducing their electricity bills by 25 percent. But then we went even further, Mr. Speaker. We brought forward our social programs, the OESP program, the Triple RP program. For those folks that live in the rural or northern parts of our province, they're going to see a 40 to 50 percent reduction on their bill, Mr. Speaker. That's the policy decision that we made as a government. We made sure that we kept a electricity generating assets on the electricity side, Mr. Speaker, and those social programs that I talked about, we pulled those off the rate base to lower the rates even more, and we put that on the tax base, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to putting families first, it's this government that does so, Mr. Speaker. It's this government that brought forward the reduction. It's this government that continues to bring forward plans and policies that will continue to help the families. A member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, second time. Wrap up, please. One sentence. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is this government, not the opposition, that is making a difference in the lives of families in this province each and every day. Hey, hey. Final supplement. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the acting premier. Hydro bills in Ontario have gone up 300 percent under this Liberal government. They've gone up 50 percent just under the Premier's reign alone. But instead of reversing her wrong-headed decision to sell off Hydro One, the Premier paid consultants $2 million to design a $4 billion financial scheme designed to hide the fact that she's costing Ontario families $40 billion more than necessary. Instead of remortgaging the cost of Hydro on the backs of Ontarians, why did didn't this Liberal government come up with a real solution to address the skyrocketing, skyrocketing hydro prices in this province? Thank you. Minister of Energy, Mr. Speaker. Of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The solution that we brought forward is a 25 per cent reduction for all homes in this province, for all families, and for 500,000 small businesses and farms, Mr. Speaker. Their plan doesn't do anything to even address taking one cent off anyone's bills, Mr. Speaker. They didn't even include First Nations or even contemplate what we can do for low-income individuals where we did, Mr. Speaker. We brought forward the Ontario Electricity Support Program. We have an on-reserve First Nation delivery credit removal, and we've also created the Triple RP. We've made sure, Mr. Speaker, that we've looked after the individuals in our province, and we know we got more work to do. 
We'll continue to have consultations to talk about small businesses, Mr. Speaker. We'll continue to work with our, our, our uh, large industries, Mr. Speaker, unlike the opposition party that has Answer. no plan nope. and one that has a plan that won't work. This plan on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, really? is saving all families in this province money. Hey, hey. New question, the Leader of the Third Party. Well, speaker, sadly, 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 this is my second speaker's second from Sadly, 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 the people of Ontario have seen all too closely the Liberal plan. That's why the hydro rates are going up in this province, because of Liberal plans, because of what the Liberals have done to our electricity system over 14 years. Look, the Premier has taken responsibility already for the high cost of hydro in Ontario. She actually said it was her own fault. When will the Liberal government take responsibility for using billions of public dollars to try to deceive Ontario families into believing that she actually fixed the problem that she caused? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, that, that, that was awful. I'm going to ask the member to withdraw. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to helping families in this province, 25 per cent reduction means that rates are going down, Mr. Speaker. They're going down for every single household. They're going down for 500,000 small businesses and farms, and we're continuing to work to reduce our rates even more. But you know what, Mr. Speaker? We did have to make sure that we invested in a system, $70 billion in a system, to make sure that we can have a clean system and a reliable system. And I know today, Mr. Speaker, that system that we have is 90, over 90% 90 GHG free. We're making sure that there is no coal in our electricity supply mix. We are the tip of the spear when it comes to North America, Mr. Speaker. And I know the other opposition parties will talk about Answer. it, but this is action that we've done. We've lowered our, our emissions. We've made sure we're helping on the health care system because these are saving dollars to our health care side, Mr. Speaker. These were Thank the you. right things to do. At the end of the day, we'll continue to help families. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, the running tab for the cost of the Premier's hydro borrowing scheme is this. $40 billion for the plan itself, $4 billion to hide the long-term cost of the plan, $2 million on consultants to design the $4 billion financial scheme, and $500,000 for a lawyer to screen emails going to the Auditor General as she attempts to tell the people of Ontario just how bad this hydro scheme is for them. Does the government plan to spend any more public money on a desperate attempt to convince voters that their hydro bills haven't gone up over 300 per cent on their government's watch? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, 25 per cent reduction, all households in this province. That means rates are going down in this province, Mr. Speaker. But let's talk about the savings that this government has made by investing in a clean, green, reliable electricity system. When it comes to the health care system, Mr. Speaker, $4.3 billion in health care cost savings thanks to this government closing coal plants. That's $70 billion that we're going to see, Mr. Speaker, by 2055. That is something we need to ensure that we keep doing, Mr. Speaker, unlike the opposition parties that have no plan or no idea on actually how to do this, Mr. Speaker. 43% Sorry, 41% reductions in health care costs, 23% in health care deaths, thanks to the investments that we Answer. have made in this system. We're going to continue to be leaders in this, in this country, in North America, when it comes to our electricity grid and making sure that it's clean, it's, clean, it's green, it's reliable and affordable, Mr. Speaker. Speaker. Thanks, Speaker. Uh, my question this morning is for the Acting Premier. We learned last week in court that former cabinet secretary Peter Wallace told a premier's chief of staff, quote, the only organization chief that government didn't whip. keep any records was a criminal organization, uh -oh. end quote. Uh -oh. So I'm sure that it's only a coincidence that the government lawyered up this time when the auditor general asked for what turned out to be two million emails from the energy ministry. Speaker, why has the government only turned over 1%, actually less than 1% of the documents that the Auditor General has asked for from the government? Thank you. Minister of Energy. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So when it comes to the documents they're asked by the Auditor General, we are in full compliance, Mr. Speaker. Since um, October 13th, we've provided over 13,000 documents, Mr. Speaker. And how did we get to that number? On top of all the other documents that all the other associations are getting to, we actually took the phrases that the Auditor General had asked for and recognized that there were 80 custodians of those phrases. And that were 40 phrases. That produced two million documents. Wow. Those two million documents were then reviewed to make sure which ones applied specifically to this ask and what was close, and that provided 145,000 documents. Then the Ministry of Energy, Mr. Speaker, is working hard to go through all of those documents to provide all of them that relate to the Fair Hydro Plan to the Auditor General. I know the opposition Answer. member knows this, and that's something that we're going to continue to talk about, Mr. Speaker, because at the end of the day, we are doing everything that we're supposed to do as a government Thank to you. provide these documents to the Auditor General. Speaker, the minister just talked about a lot of numbers, and one thing we learned last week in the Auditor General's report is we can't believe a single number that this government brings forward any longer. All of their numbers are in a cloud out of controversy. Speaker, the last time the government stalled and stalled and stalled on handing over the documents, do you remember how much that cost the taxpayers of Ontario? Over a billion dollars. And we also got to learn about all kinds of neat things like the secret code names they were using, like Project Vapor and Project Fruit Salad and Pete's Project that was going on and the infamous double delete. How many secret codes are we going to find about this time? But we know that the lawyers are in there deciding which documents that they're going to turn over to the Auditor General. This latest electricity scheme is going to cost electricity Question. customers in Ontario $4 billion. Speaker, this time the government lawyered up first. What are they trying Thank to you. hide from Ontario now? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, it begs the question as to what are they trying to hide, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to the fact that they keep talking about an idea that they may have had somewhere close to maybe a year ago that they might launch and talk about a plan that they might have. I know the only number that we know is we're getting closer and closer to 365 days before they would even talk about having doing something for the people of Ontario. We, on the other hand, this government, Mr. Speaker, has provided another number that everyone knows, a 25 percent reduction on everyone's bills from one side of our province to the other. For those that live in rural or northern parts of the province, they will even see Mr. Moore, uh, Mr. Moore, more, Mr. Speaker. But at the end of the day, we're making sure that we're acting, Mr. Speaker. We're acting for the people Answer. of Ontario with a clean system, an affordable system, and a reliable system. That's a plan that you can count on, Mr. Speaker, Thank not you. like the opposition. Hey, hey. Thank you. New question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Acting Premier. Two years ago, the Premier insisted that a privatized Hydro One would not drive up hydro rates because the Ontario Energy Board would keep it in check. We now know that Hydro One refuses to be regulated by the OEB. Even after the OEB gave it nearly everything it asked for, including 71% of a $2.6 billion tax gift from that government, Hydro One is taking the OEB to court to demand 100 per cent of that gift. Shameful. According to OEB precedent, this tax benefit should be going to ratepayers, not to shareholders. Why does the Premier think it's acceptable for Hydro One to demand 100 per cent of this $2.6 billion gift on behalf of investors while leaving nothing for ratepayers. Thank you. To the birthday boy, the Minister of Energy, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, I thank the honourable member for the question, and I know we had this discussion last week as well. But really, when you're looking on um, Hydro One's draft rate order, what we're talking about now, Mr. Speaker, is it's an estimated bill impact for 2017 that would be an increase of 0.1 percent and 0.2 percent for 2018. Um, but that being said, our Fair Hydro plan has lowered bills 
by 25 per cent on average for households and as many as a half million small businesses and farms um, this summer, Mr. Speaker. I, I know. Um, you know, our rural customers have also uh, seeing even a greater uh, decrease uh, from this, somewhere between 40 and 50 percent. These are, are truly substantial savings, and so we're going to continue to to monitor this, Mr. Speaker. But at the end of the day, we'll continue to work with all of our utilities to to ensure that we continue to provide real relief, yes, immediate relief for the families and businesses that are in our province. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Supplementary. Speaker again to the Acting Premier. Last week, the government said the system was working just fine because the OEB had told Hydro One to reduce its revenue demands. It turns out Hydro One basically ignored the OEB decision. The privatized Hydro One came back with new revenue demand that was nearly as high as the first demand, and then it took the OEB to court. Will the Premier finally admit? that Hydro One will not accept regulation by the Ontario Energy Board and that the only way to stop private profits from driving up hydro bills is to return Hydro One to public hands. Thank you. You see that, please? You see that, please? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the OEB's decision is a great example of the strong record they have of denying, denying hydro companies all that they ask for and reviewing rate applications with the consumer in mind first and foremost. And over the past 10 years, the OEB has denied or reduced the outcome of rate applications many times in 2010, in 2012, in 2011, in 2014, again in 2011, even for example uh, with Toronto Hydro. They made a request to the OEB and received a 10.8 per cent uh, less than uh, requested reduction. The OEB's mandate, Mr. Speaker, is to protect the interest of ratepayers and to set just and reasonable rates. When it comes to the tax deferral piece, Mr. Speaker, as the independent arm legs regulator of the province, um, the OEB continues to balance the interests of consumers with those of the utilities. Part of the OEB's Sir. decision and order included the deferral tax issue, and the OEB has indicated that some of the value of the tax increase or that tax asset should Thank be you. given to ratepayers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Minister responsible for accessibility, the Honourable Tracy McCharles. Speaker, Ontarians appreciate our government's work towards making Ontario more accessible. People of all abilities deserve to reach their social and economic potential by contributing their diverse skills and talents in the Ontario's workplace. Unfortunately, Speaker, as you'll appreciate, many Ontario employers are still reluctant to hire people with disabilities, and yet nearly a third of Ontario's small and medium-sized businesses report having difficulty filling job vacancies. Despite this, studies show that workers with disabilities are more loyal, better, have better attendance, and in fact perform better than average on the job. As well, most workers with disabilities only require minor accommodations to work. A more diverse workforce, including people with disabilities, helps Ontario businesses with productivity, innovation and exports. Speaker, my question is this. Will the minister please explain what steps our government is doing to shift attitudes about accessibility Carson. and increase the participation of persons with disabilities in Ontario's workforce? Good thank question. you. Minister responsible for accessibility. Thank you. And I want to thank the member from Etobicoke North for this very important question. This summer, I was very pleased, Speaker, to launch Access Talent. This is Ontario's employment strategy for people with disabilities, and I was joined by many colleague uh, ministers on this very important uh, initiative. So Access Talent outlines our vision for the future, a province where everyone has a chance to reach their full potential and make a meaningful contribution to our economic prosperity and social growth. We're calling on employers to join us to take action and hire at least one more person with a disability and give people the opportunity to help further build their businesses and grow our economy. Our plan involves drawing from the knowledge and lived experiences from people across all sectors, including Francophone communities and First Nations and answer. Indigenous people, to reflect the diversity of people with disabilities. I'll be pleased to answer more in the supplementary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Minister. I think all of us appreciate your engagement uh, on this portfolio. Speaker, one of the frustrations that I hear about as an MPP is how particular constituents are yet unable to find work because of the barriers they may face because of their own personal disabilities. The employment rate for people with disabilities is less than 50 per cent, 
and a quarter of those employed feel they are working in a role that does not really reflect the breadth of their qualifications. When we limit people's abilities as individuals, we limit our strength as a province. Speaker, last month, as part of Access Talent, the minister responsible for accessibility announced the establishment of a new employers' partnership table to advise the government on innovative ways to connect people with disabilities to jobs and businesses to talent. Speaker, will the minister please explain to the House how the new employers table is going to advance employment for people with disabilities in the province of Ontario? Question. Thank you, Minister. Speaker, our um, employers' partnership table is a major step forward for Ontario's groundbreaking strategy to increase jobs for persons with disabilities. As business leaders and entrepreneurs, our partners know the importance of expanding their customer base to include persons with disabilities while creating a workforce that reflects the diverse nature of their customers. I want to thank the members who joined this partnership table. I was just telling my colleague to the left of me, these folks are not only meeting at, at scheduled times, they're exchanging emails. They really want to move the yardstick forward on this. They're going to advocate for hiring people with disabilities within their business circles and communities, influencing businesses, dispelling myths and misconceptions about employing people with disabilities. They have lots of uh, professional expertise, Speaker, that they're bringing to the table, best practices. And it's initiatives like this, Speaker, that show our government Answer. is creating meaningful and positive change, both socially and economically, in Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. Your question, the member from Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. <laughs> Speaker, every day we read about the opioid crisis in Ontario and the many deaths resulting from overdose. Police officers, who are often first to find those who have overdosed or run the risk of inadvertently ingesting the illicit drugs during their duty, that place their lives on risk. Back in October, the government announced the expansion of the supply of naloxone. Unfortunately, these first responders were ignored in the announcement. This has left many police services struggling to find the money to equip their officers with this life-saving treatment. It's created a two-tier system in the province where some officers have access to naloxones and others do not. Mr. Speaker, the opioid crisis has overtaken Ontario. We need leadership and support for our police officers throughout the province. Will the minister ensure a portion of the funds his government committed to the crisis helps police services purchase naloxone for their officers? Here, here. Thank you, Minister of Health, Long -term care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I know the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services will want to speak to this issue in the supplementary, but I wanted to take the opportunity, since uh, the member referenced uh, appropriately the opioid crisis, the public health emergency that we're facing in this province as well as across the country. I was at, uh, last Thursday and Friday, the, the federal, provincial and territorial health ministers meeting, where we had opportunity on both days, Mr. Speaker, to uh, work together on the crisis and what more we could do collectively and nationally, uh, looking particularly to the federal leadership at ways that they could work to, with us to make sure that those supports that are so badly needed by our harm reduction workers and at the front line, including the safe injection services, including the, uh, the uh, uh, providing support to those, quite frankly, who are dying in incredible numbers uh, and are extremely vulnerable and marginalized, that we can provide that support that's needed. It includes the provision of naloxone. I think we're distributing in the order of 8,000 kits every single month through a whole myriad of opportunities. And again, the Minister of Correction, uh, Community Safety and Correctional Services will want to address this specifically Thank you. supplementary. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, back to the Minister. Speaker, police services have informed me that they have had to shift money in their budgets to try and provide naloxone to their officers. Unfortunately, this comes at a cost of other police services that keep our public safe. This government has been too slow to act on this crisis, which has placed a heavy burden on police service budgets. Due to their lack of support, some regions of the province may not have access to naloxone for their police officers, putting the safety of both the public and the officers at risk. Speaker, will the minister commit to expanding the availability of naloxone to include our frontline police officers throughout this province? Minister. Again, to the Minister of Community Services and Community Safety and Correctional Services. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Well, thank you very much. And I want to say thanks to the uh, member opposite for the questions. And I know that he, and I would say everyone in this House, uh, is committed to ending the op opioid crisis. Several police services have outfitted their frontline officers with naloxone kits, and that includes a few in the member opposite's own writing, such as the Elmer Police Services and the OPP, who have equipped all their frontline officers with life saving naloxone, Mr. Speaker. Municipal 
municipalities are in the end responsible for ensuring an effective police services that meets their needs. And as part of our strategy for a safer Ontario, we are moving forward towards an outcome-based funding model. Okay. Moving forward with this modernization, police services will have more funding yes, for local priorities, like Naloxone for police. And when the bill is introduced, I strongly encourage the member to support it. Thank you. The, thank you very much. <coughs> New question. The member from London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Speaker, on Friday, October 20th, student leaders at eight Ontario colleges urged the government to get college administrators and striking faculty back to the bargaining table so that a negotiated settlement can be reached and 500,000 college students can return to their classrooms. My colleague Cindy Forster and I, uh, the member for Welland, reinforced their call in an open letter to the Premier. Speaker, students feel that they are caught in the middle. They worry whether they will be able to complete their program requirements. Many are paying both tuition and rent and are understandably anxious about the financial burden they are carrying when their semester might be lost. Speaker, what is this Liberal government going to do to bring the parties back to the table so that a fair resolution can be achieved? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development. Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, we share the members' concern, obviously, about, uh, about the length of time that this strike has been ongoing. And I perhaps uh, have an interest here, maybe I have a conflict of interest. I have two sons, Mr. Speaker, uh, one at uh, George Brown uh, taking construction engineering, another at Centennial College taking HVAC. Both graduate this spring, so they too are anxious about what the potential impacts this may have on their year. Uh, so we on this, there's no monopoly here on caring about the, uh, the interests of these students. I think we all care equally. I think the best thing we can do at this stage is to urge both sides uh, to, to stay at that bargaining table and, yep. and get to a deal as soon as possible because there's no question the time being taken impacts our students. Answer. But Mr. Speaker, I guess my, it may be in, in the supplementary question, the member can tell me, is her party suggested, suggesting that now's the time for us to legislate them back? Is that what they're suggesting? Because that's the only tool we have. And to the Acting Premier, Speaker, provincial underfunding of Ontario colleges has resulted in tuition fees increased to the maximum, <laughs> ballooning class sizes, and an explosion in the use of temporary contract and part-time instructors, Jeez. all of which puts quality of education at risk. College student enrollment is at record highs, but full-time faculty have all but disappeared. 80% of faculty are precarious part-time workers with no job security and no benefits who must reapply for their jobs every four months. This is not fair to students, and it is not fair to faculty. Speaker, what is this Liberal government prepared to do to ensure a fair negotiated agreement that includes the resources necessary to implement equal pay for equal work in the college Question. sector. Minister? Oh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, please. Thank you. Minister. I've been asking questions on a daily basis uh, on this, and I understand the concern that we both have and we all have for our students. But, Mr. Speaker, what are they suggesting we do? I, I mean, the alternative is, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Mr. St Speaker, we're strongly urging both sides to get to an agreement as soon as possible. That's in the interest of, of, of our students, Mr. Speaker. But is the member suggesting that now's the time for us to legislate them back? If that's what you're suggesting, then come out and say it and stop hiding behind the rhetoric. Because, Mr. Speaker, there's been no government that's been done more Thank for you. the college system than ours. Thank you. New question, the member from Durham. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. In my riding, I often hear from constituents on the work of this government on the energy file. The constituents of Durham know how critical a clean, reliable energy system is to Ontario being a great place to live and work, Speaker. 
and that's why the refurbishment of our nuclear fleet is so important to them. But recently... Thank you. Finish, please. Thank you, Speaker. A new story that focused on, on the refurbishment sub-project cited cost overruns as a concern. Now my constituents are worried that the project might, might go over the set budget or will be delayed. They are worried because they know that the nuclear industry is not only a source of clean and safe energy, but that it Question. also brings a substantial economic benefit to the region of Durham. Mr. Speaker, could the minister please update the House and my constituents on how the recruitment project is going? Minister of Energy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I also, want to, uh, I also want to thank the member for that question and for all of the hard work he puts in every day for all of his constituents. Yeah. As I've said before, the refurbishment of the Darlington Generating Station remains on time and on budget. The news story mentioned by the member from Durham focuses on only one of about 500 small sub-projects that make up the entire Darlington refurbishment program. There is adequate contingency within the overall refurbishment project to fund any risks related to this sub project. As Ontario Power Generation states in their Q2 refurbishment update, which you can now find on their website, they are now at the quarter waypoint and remain on time and on budget. The Darlington refurbishment project is a Made in Canada initiative with 96 per cent of related expenditures happening in Ontario. This means more investment into our already booming economy. Mr. Speaker, I want to assure Answer. the member from Durham and this House that the Darlington refurbishment remains on time and on budget. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for your answer. Since the Darlington Nuclear Generation Station is in the Great Riding of Durham, the economic, the economic and job creation benefits are well celebrated by my constituents. We are also very proud of, of the work that is being done on the Darlington Generating Station which provides about 20% of the province's electricity needs, enough to serve a city of over 2 million people. After six years of detailed planning and preparations, Ontario Power Generation is, has safely shut down the Unit 2 reactor at the Darlington Nuclear Station. On October 15, 2016, initiating the refurbishment of the first of four units at the power plant. The refurbishment of Darlington will ensure we have safe, reliable, emission-free energy where, it, where it's needed. Minister, it's my understanding that you'll be re releasing a government long-term energy plan later this week. Can you provide us with an update specifically Thank you. regarding the nuclear plan? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member is correct in pointing out that refurbishment of Darlington and other nuclear generating stations in our province will generate um, economic benefits, Mr. Speaker. Refurbishing, on, refurbishing Ontario's nuclear capacity will create almost 25,000 jobs and generate annual economic activity of $5 billion. Sixty companies from across Ontario are contributing to the project. All told, it is estimated that the 10-year project, together with Darlington's an additional 30 years of operation, will boost Ontario's GDP by almost $90 billion wow. and create an average of 14,200 new jobs each and every year over that same period. This week, Mr. Speaker, our government will release the 2017 Long-Term Energy Plan, and I am pleased to say that it will take major steps towards delivering on the mandate letter yes, objective sir. by the Premier to me, namely refurbishing the 10 nuclear units in Ontario, both at Darlington and at Bruce. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. New question. Member from Huron, Bruce. Very much, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. On September 7, the Ontario Agricultural College at the University of Guelph published their Planning for Tomorrow 2.0 report. This report found that the labour gap in the agri-food sector has grown from three jobs for every graduate to four in just two short years. In fact, financial institutions have estimated that that gap is even higher in their sector. Clearly, Speaker, under this minister's watch, this situation has eroded and is only getting worse. 
Speaker, does the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs not know about this report? But if he does, then why has he not taken action on my motion, Growing Agri-Food Careers? Yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, I, I want to thank the uh, member for a question this morning. And I think what it, uh, what it reflects is the agriculture and agri-food uh, sector of Ontario's economy is one of the fastest growing uh, sectors in Ontario today. $37 billion, 800,000 uh, 800, people employed in there, and of course the Premier's target of 120,000 new jobs by the year 2020. We're on track to make that happen. 59,000 new jobs created to date, which is putting demands, of course, on our labour supply. We continue to work with all educational institutions across the province of Ontario to make sure that we have adequate human resources to drive this sector forward. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister. And unfortunately, I do not agree with what he just said. When the Premier was Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, yes, she challenged the industry to create 120,000 new jobs. They are nowhere near close to matching that number. They're not even close. My Growing Agri-Food Careers motion is a good step in helping the sector meet that challenge. But over the last couple of years, we have not seen any action taken on this motion, which I might add received support from all parties. Speaker, I've been meeting with a wide number of people, including industry representatives, Eggscape, OAC alumni, and they all share my concern that this motion has yet to be implemented. Yep. So, Speaker, on behalf of our young people and the industry stakeholders and Eggscape, and OAC and their alumni, will the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs Question. do the right thing and get this motion implemented immediately? Yes, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for a supplementary question. And, uh, I just wanted to provide this House with some information. That's why our government is partnering with the University of Guelph, investing more than $7.5 billion in graduate scholarships over the past decade through our highly qualified personal scholarship program. And again, Mr. Speaker, working with my colleague, the Minister of Education, we're now embarked upon a curriculum review. And I know the Minister wants to enshrine agriculture edu education into the curriculum to make sure we have adequate people for the fastest growing sector in Ontario's economy today. Thank you. Question to the member from Timmins, James Bay. Health. Minister, last week in Timmins, a 16-year-old boy with mental health needs had to be treated in the emergency ward because there were no beds in that hospital to be able to treat them. This morning, we hear that there's eight new beds being announced in the city of Timmins, but that's cold comfort to patients who are continually having to be treated in the same way, getting hallway medicine rather than getting the bed that they need to be treated. Minister, talk of how much money your government claims to have spent as cold comfort to patients and their families across Ontario that still don't have access to the health care they need, despite your claims to the contrary. No one, especially not a 16-year-old with so much life ahead of them, should suffer in today's Ontario because of the lack of access to proper health care. When will this government admit that they're not doing enough to deal with this problem? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question. I'm not sure whether the member is um, uh, is appreciating the fact that eight new beds are being opened probably within the next two to four weeks in Timmins Hospital. I'm not sure if he's supportive of that or if he's not supportive of that, Mr. Speaker. But and. I made an important uh, announcement just uh, over an hour ago, Mr. Speaker, where we announced uh, $140 million wow. available immediately to open up two th over 2,000 ho new hospital beds and spaces across this province. And Mr. Speaker, if there's anything that's going to deal with the challenge that the member opposite has expressed, it's that. 1,200 new hospital beds opening, many if not most in the next two to four weeks, Mr. Speaker. Wow. Approximately 600 transitional care spaces for specialized care, including the Humber River Finch site, 150 beds that that party appears to be opposed Answer. to, Mr. Speaker, wow. and 200 new supportive housing units specifically for seniors. If that's not good news, Thank I don't you. understand the nature of the context. Thank you. Supplementary. To tell you what is not good news, 
Minister, I will tell you what is not good news is when a government refuses to do something and only reacts when there's a crisis, only when our leader lands in this House and asks question after question. Members of this caucus, people across Ontario, hospital CEOs and others who have been saying for years you have underfunded the hospital system. You froze the budget for how many years? So now, because there's an election coming this spring, you're finally doing something and announcing beds and tenements? Of course we're going to take them. The chair, but, Minister, please. you know it falls short of what needs to be done. So will you please now admit that there is a problem in our health care system? I'll let, I'll let the question stand. But address your questions and your answers to the chair, please. Minister. Mr. Speaker, with this announcement, we are opening the equivalent of six new medium-sized hospitals in this province in this calendar year, Mr. Speaker. And I wonder if the member from Welland, where we're opening 20 beds at Windsor, or, sorry, at Windsor, where we're opening 20 beds at Windsor Regional Hospital, or London Health Sciences, if the members from London, where we're opening 24 new acute beds and 24 acute mental health beds, effective immediately, Mr. Speaker, or Hamilton Health Sciences. Where we're opening 30 new beds. Niagara at the Welland sent at the Welland site for the Welland member, Mr. Speaker, 26 new beds. Or St. Joe's downtown Hamilton, 24 new beds. Or at Lake Ridge at Oshawa. I wonder if the member from Oshawa is opposed to the 22 new beds there. I know the member from Peterborough on our side is very happy that we're opening 20 new beds in Peterborough. And the member from Quinty, the fact that we're opening 15 beds there. Or in Ottawa, the 45 new beds in Ottawa. Or the 30 new beds, 36 new beds in Barrie, Mr. Speaker, at the Royal Vic. Thank I you. know it's good news on this side. I don't know why they're at. Thank you. Stop, stop. You see there, please? You see there, please? Start the clock. Thank you. New question, member from Barrie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Economic Development and Growth. On this side of the House, we know how important it is to have a plan for the future, one that ensures Ontario can grow in this fast-changing, fiercely competitive global economy. Mr. Speaker, the minister has been telling us for some time now about how important the information and communication technology sector is to Ontario. And if you look at the numbers, Ontario truly has become a global leading innovation hub. Ontario is now the first in Canada and second in North America in the number of ICT establishments behind only California. Ontario is now home to two of the largest startup ecosystems in the world, Toronto and Waterloo. We know that we've seen investment in the past from major companies like Google, Apple, IBM, and Thomson Reuters. Can the minister please tell us about some of the more Question. recent and exciting developments for Ontario's ICT sector? Thank you, Minister of Economic Development and Growth. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The member is absolutely right. Uh, this government recognized quite early that the global economy was shifting, and we needed to be at the forefront of that change. We entirely restructured our Ministry of Economic Development and our economic development strategy. We needed to focus on investments that allow our startups to become scale-ups and our scale-ups to become globally competitive. Just this week, we've seen two new exciting investments in Ontario's booming ICT sector. One example of that growth, Mr. Speaker, Speaker is Shopify, a home-grown e-commerce giant located in Ottawa and a company changing the face of retail. Last week, they announced a further expansion here in Ontario of 500 new jobs in Waterloo. Another example is Sidewalk Labs, a subsidiary of Global Sir. Story Company. And Mr. Speaker, after a global search, they decided the best place in the world for them to locate was here in Ontario. I'm very proud of that, Mr. Speaker. Any questions? Uh, supplementary? Thank you to the minister for answering my question. We know that Ontario's information and communication technology sector already directly employs about 280,000 people all across this province. Most of that employment is a result of our highly skilled talent that has been created right here in Ontario and in Barrie at Georgian College. 
The sector relies on Ontario's leading 44 universities, which graduate thousands of STEM students per year. These are great numbers and allow us to compete right now. But we know things are changing rapidly across the world, and in this competitive global environment, jurisdictions across the world are pulling out all stops to attract investment and lure talent. Can the minister please tell us about how we plan to ensure Ontario continues to be a leader in job creation and grow a strong, diverse minister. community? Yeah. Well, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And no, no question. The member is absolutely right. Ontario is in a position of strength. We've added 800,000 net new jobs since the global recession. Our unemployment rate is at the lowest level we've seen in 17 wow. years. Being in that position of strength gives us the ability to focus our attention on growing an innovative economy. Mr. Speaker, last week we took another step in that direction. Because the member is also right, our talent is the key to our future. So last week we announced, Mr. Speaker, that we're going to expand that talent pipeline. We're going to grow the number of STEM students in this province from 40,000 to 50,000 graduates every year. And, and over the next five years, Mr. Speaker, we're going to increase the annual graduations uh, for uh, to 1,000 applied master's yes, students in AI. Mr. Speaker, that's going to make us stronger. We're going to keep growing, and we're very proud of those investments, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The member from Nipissing, uh, point of order. Point of order, Speaker. Uh, in addition to. Uh, my uh, mother, my aunt, my niece, uh, and my in-laws being here. I've got 40 uh, members and friends from uh, uh, family and friends from North Bay here today. Yeah. Welcome. Member from Essex on a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. I'd be remiss to uh, not welcome a, a part of my constituency team. It's his first visit to Queen's Park and first question period. Nolan Hennon is here today visiting. Thank the you. Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Point of Thank order. you, Mr. Speaker. I'd also be remiss if I didn't welcome Neil Roberts, who is here with us, the Executive Director of the Ontario Association of Paramedic Chiefs. Uh, this evening is the Emergency Medical Service Exemplary Services Award Ceremony, where the Lieutenant Governor will be presenting awards to 39 Ontario paramedics who have provided distinguished pre hospital care to Ontarians for 30 years and for 40 years, Mr. Speaker. Welcome. Thank you. Point of order, the Minister, the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to say that today we have uh, my seatmate to celebrating a very important day. It's his birthday, and I would like us to say happy birthday to Glenn Thibault, who's doing a fantastic job for our people Thank of you. Sudbury. Thank you. There being no deferred votes, this House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.